Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sake Revolution. This is America's first sake podcast, and I am your host, John Puma from the Sake Notes. Uh, also, I'm the guy to start the Internet Sake Discord, that corner of the internet where we all get together and talk about sake. And I am enduring some sweltering heat. And I'm your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai, sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And every week, John and I will be here tasting and chatting about all things sake and doing our best to make it fun and easy to understand. Ah, Tim, you know, my favorite comment that I hear uh, often in, uh, in times like these is, so is it hot enough for you? Well, I have a bone to pick with you, Puma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not taking responsibility for this. If this is where you're going. <laughs> Last week, I mean, how often have we started our podcast with weather chit chat? Like almost never. But <laughs> last week, you said how it was summer but not too hot, and how the sidewalks weren't absorbing the heat. And today, I almost literally melted on the sidewalk outside because it was so hot. I blame you. I don't think I have that kind of power over <laughs> uh, the climate, really. But, you know, Tim, it is, as you have implied, hot in New York now. It is dog yes. hot. It is disgusting out there. Yes, it is uh -huh. an inferno. Yuck. Although not as bad as Japan in the summer, I have to say. I, 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 yeah. And, and I've been hearing from people who are over there that it is it is historically horrible right now. It oh is incredibly God. hot and humid and muggy. And I've, I've never had the pleasure of being there in the summertime. Yeah. I'm going to keep it that way for the foreseeable future. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I mean, not that I have a choice in the matter. Oh my gosh. But <laughs> yeah. Well, last year at this time, in our infinite wisdom as newbie sake podcasters, we rolled out a hot sake episode twice. Yeah, we did this. We, it's now become a tradition. <laughs> so yeah, every summer we roll out a hot sake episode. But the, the, the tradition ends today, Tim, or not <laughs> this time. I refuse. <laughs> this time we are not doing hot sake. No, sir. We are going the alternative route. We are going the opposite of hot sake today. We're doing cold sake. Today. Not just cold sake. <laughs> We're going beyond the valley of cold sake. <laughs> yes. All right, Tim. Tell the listeners at home what beyond cold sake means. Well, there is a type of sake that I discovered in Japan a few years ago, and it's on the very bottom of the temperature chart, and yeah. it's called uh, Mizore sake. Mizore. Mizore. And, and Mizore means what exactly? Mizore in Japanese means what we would in English call sleet. It's a mixture <laughs> of snow and rain. Okay. Yeah. So what we're actually going for today is a sake slushy. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. I love it. And, and weather appropriate. Of Finally. Course, <laughs> yes, I'm saying this. And then next week when we publish this episode, it's going to dramatic. The temperature is going to drop to 40. <laughs> We're going to be like, what's going on? John, you did it again. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I also experienced this uh, originally in Japan Ma many years ago, actually. There's a, there is a standing bar in Ebisu that is very foreigner friendly. So early on in my, in my sake travels, I was referred to a place called Buri. It's a full bar and an izakaya with a lot of different food, but most of their sake selection consists of one cups. And completely unbeknownst to me, they will slush them up for you. When you say slush them up for you, <laughs> what can you give me some more info? So uh, essentially, if you store sake at uh, around 23 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, negative 5 Celsius, it's going to be liquid when you take it out of the freezer. But as soon as it's agitated, it's going to frost up. Mm, so yeah. what they would do at Buri is they'll take the cups you would like out of the freezer. And if you would like to have them made slushy, they will slap the top of the cup a few times and then whoosh, it'll just turn into a slushy before your eyes. Uh, and then they take the top off. That sounds a little bit like 
sake witchcraft. <laughs> it, it definitely <laughs> looks like sake witchcraft. It's it's funny though. I actually accidentally did this at home once, many years ago. I uh, you slushified your sake by mistake. I did I? Um, I it was late. And there was a bottle that we forgot to refrigerate or we had just gotten it or something like that. And so I put it in the freezer so that it would chill and then I would be able to drink it in like, you know, a half hour or something like that, I thought maybe. And I totally forgot the bottle in the freezer. So the next day I went into the freezer to get something and I opened it up. I'm like, oh, that's the sake is in there from yesterday. I forgot all about it. Well, I, I, well, I might as well have some sake. It's, it's still a liquid. So I guess there was enough alcohol in there for it to not freeze. So I took the bottle out and I sat down and I started pouring it into a glass. And as I'm pouring it, it's like, like turning into slush. And and I was alarmed and a little perplexed <laughs> and pulled the bottle away really fast, which jostled the whole thing. And the entire inside contents of the bottle started turning into slush. And I was freaking out thinking I like ruined the sake. And – you thought you ruined the sake, but you secretly invented sake slushies in Queens. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't uh, didn't know that was a, a thing you can do. Yeah, but it was fun. It's nice. It's a it's a nice different way to experience sake, and I think it's a a fun a fun change of pace, especially yes. in these in these hot hot days. Yes. Hot days. So I think you're you're right on the money. There's two ways to do this. If you have the sake one cups, which are so much fun, you just give it a shake, like yeah. just shake it. And if you have like a small bottle of sake, if it's still liquid inside, but again, like you mentioned around the 25 degree Fahrenheit, if you forcefully pour it out into a glass cup, when it hits the cup, that's going to agitate the sake enough to crystallize it. And mm -hmm. It is so cool to see that. So either way, whether you have a small bottle of sake or you have the cup, you can make sake slushies at home. Yeah. Now, we, we should give all our listeners a warning about aggressive American freezers too, right? Yeah. So years ago when I did this by accident, my freezer wasn't spectacular. It was kind of, eh. and so I accidentally had the right temperature when I pulled it yes. out of the freezer. When we were preparing for this episode, I failed to look at what temperature my new crazy industrial Samsung, uh, not really industrial, but my, my new Samsung fridge keeps itself at. And so it froze the sake solid. <laughs> yes. Because my refrigerator is five degrees Fahrenheit, which is significantly lower than the 23 we're looking for. Yes. And my freezer is minus two Fahrenheit. Wow. So very, very cold. And it will freeze sake around 15% alcohol. It'll freeze mm -hmm. it solid at that temperature. Yeah. So if you want to make a sake slushy at home and you have a modern, powerful freezer, you need to put it in, what would you say, about two hours, hour and a half? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So before you want to have the slushy, you want to put your sake into the freezer, but you can't put it in there the day ahead of time because it's just going to freeze solid. Yeah. Um, so yeah. maybe two hours ahead of time, and you want to temp it at around 25 Fahrenheit. Yeah. I, I can't even set my freezer to 25 Fahrenheit. <laughs> it won't let me. <laughs> it won't let you. The highest temperature I could set my freezer to is eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's not going to help. So, yeah. It, it takes a work. little planning. It takes a little planning. But luckily here at Sake Revolution, we planned. This is the kind of recipe I like, John. Put your sake into the freezer 90 minutes before serving <laughs> and then shake vigorously. I can handle a recipe like this. Oh, it's pretty good. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> so, uh, Tim, what sake did you bring for your uh, for our little experiment here? I have a new cup on the block. Ooh. Uh, this is a sake that we know and love that was recently exported as a can. So it's technically one cup, but it's a metal can. And it's Nambu Bijin Tokubetsu Junmai, which is a sake Ooh. we've had on the show before and I absolutely love it. The alcohol percentage here is 15.5. This is from the Nambu Bijin Brewery out of Iwate Prefecture. 
They use that local Gin Otome rice milled to 55%. And the SMV is plus five. And it's a blend of two yeasts, the Association M310 and the Association 1901. Ah. And John, what sake did you bring? I have the Chiyo Musubi uh, Oyaji Gokuraku Junmai Ginjo. It's a rare Junmai Ginjo one cup. Uh, it is from Chiyo Musubi Brewery in Totori. The sake meter value is plus five. The acidity, 1.6. And the rice type on this is Goriki rice, which is a local Totori rice variety. It was actually very popular in like the early 1900s. It was lost during the war. And then uh, was revived, actually, in 1990 by some, uh, by some very dedicated individuals in Totori who wanted their historic rice back. And it's been milled to 50%. Mm. Chiyo Masubi makes a, a series of these cups with these those old like manga characters on them. Yeah. And so there's three of them. There's this one and then two others. And it's basically the same idea, same milling and all that, but a different rice type for each. But this one is the Goriki. All righty. Well, John, I think <laughs> it is time. We have our ice cold cups. I have mine. I've got my cup. It's, it's got a nice little frost forming on the outside from being out of the freezer finally. Mine as well. Yeah. So let's give it a shake. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the tap method and see if okay. that works for me. So let's see. I'm shaking mine. Okay. And that open? All right. Okay. I've got mine open. Now, I can drink this right out of the can, but I want to take a look at... Sure. I oh. mean, since Ooh. yours is a can, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That looks great in the glass. This is so. great radio. <laughs> mm. All right. So I've got it in the glass, and it has clumps of ice in there. It's very slushy-esque, mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of clear sake around the edges, and the majority of it is slushy in shape let's mm -hmm. give it a taste now again i'm tasting the nambu bijin tokubetsu junmai mm. well it goes without saying that this is ice cold and refreshing yeah and it it's interesting it does change the flavor a lot the texture is very different i think it has a huge impact on the texture which is really going to change your your tasting experience yeah Oh, it's just super refreshing. Mm -hmm. Ice cold. The texture is thicker, like a slushy or a icy milkshake. Yeah, yeah. And in the glass, if you were just to look at this, it almost looks like it could be nigori sake because it's all iced up and kind of whitish in color, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And... This sake, when we've tasted it before, John, the Tokubetsu Junmai from Nambu Bijin, has always been really fruity and almost tropical fruits and a hint on the sweet side. Yeah. Having it frozen like this, the alcohol comes forward more. Oh, really? And there, okay. Yes. And there is no major fruitiness. So mm. I really think it changes the aroma and palate of the sake as well makes it a lot less nuanced. I mean, it's super refreshing, but yeah. it's not as elegant as it is chilled in a wine glass. I understand that. I mean, this yeah. is a, you know, there's a reason that, that they don't do competitions where people make sake slush. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun, a fun distraction on a hot day, I think. <laughs> So there's a reason there's no gold medals for sake slushies? I, I, don't, I, don't, think, uh, I don't think North American uh, sake appraisal is going to start making a category for this, sadly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at mine. I, I Very similar here. I've got my little my, my slushy chunks in here. Crystals. Crystals. Fla flavor crystals. My fl oh, is that what it is? Mm. Mm. You know? So this sake is is less fruity and a little bit typically a little bit more rich. Like you mentioned, the alcohol is coming a little bit more forward. Yeah. But I'm also um, I'm getting a little bit more sweetness than I usually get from mm. it. 
which is interesting. It's kind of like separated out into like a sweet experience and then like a, uh, a, a, a boozy finish and ethanol finish. So it's interesting the way it's kind of, kind of separating out a little bit, but you can still get that rice flavor from it. But the, that texture is a, is just a different animal. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Cause you can kind of like, you feel it moving across your tongue very differently. And it's nice. And it, when we record here, uh, for those of you at home who are, um, aren't aware, uh, when we record, I would turn off the air conditioning because we, you would hear the air conditioners and it would mess up our recording sessions. Or at least I do. I don't know what you do, Tim. Uh, so, so having this like ice cold drink is really helping me out right now. <laughs> okay. I've got an update. Mm-hmm. I have a slushy update. All right. So the, the sake that I poured into a little glass has already, in the course of five or six minutes, it has returned to a clear liquid state. It's still yeah. cold, but those ice crystals that formed from shaking it mm-hmm. melted away pretty quickly. So this, yeah. I think this trick is a little bit transient, don't you think? It is. It is a very, you got to live in the moment, Tim. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Carpe, Carpe sake. sake. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have a question for you. Now that it's reverted. Ooh. What's yeah. the flavor like? Oh, let's taste it. Interesting. So it's it it feels like it's taken a step back towards mm-hmm. its original form, but because it is still way colder than I would normally serve it, it has more weight and more richness. Like the mm. the coldness gives it this kind of almost buttery texture. Like it's it's richer yeah. than it should be. And the nuance is, is still really buried. Mm. So I think it's it's still too frosty to enjoy the regular white wine temperature, which would be around, you know, 50 or 55 degrees right, Fahrenheit. Right. But it's it's warming up as we're sitting here talking. And it's gone from ice crystal state to just super chilled. And I still think it's too cold to yeah. really enjoy it. <laughs> The way the brewers uh, intended. With the, yeah, the brewer intent. I think this is more along the lines of something that's fun to do on a you know like again on a really hot day. You know, you want something that's really gonna kind of cool you off and make you not, <laughs> make you forget. You know, a little bit less about studying the sake in this case, a little bit more about just having something that's gonna help you chill out. Yes. <laughs> you, you know, my takeaway from this is I think if I had frozen the glass that I used to pour it into, I think that would have given me more time to study the frozen Mm. state outside of the cup. Right. We also have to say that Chiyomosubi, the Oyaji, Junmai Ginjo, and the Nambu Beach and Tokubetsu Junmai, these are great sakes, but because we're using the one cup version, it's really fun. It's affordable. And it's a very low stakes proposition here for (laughs) deep freezing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it is. And it does, you know, as you pointed out, it does change the game a little bit with regard to like how the sake is going to taste. You know, it's, it's, it is a different experience. In the case of the uh, Chiyu Masubi, this is actually shipped in a glass cup. So I was able to just pop the top and sip right out of it. Yeah. So my, my glass is frosted. Mm. (laughs) My glass is chilled. Uh, unlike yours. Yeah, the metal the metal cup is it's pretty thin metal. It did frost over, but mm-hmm. you know, it conducts heat. So if you hold it for too long, it's going to I think it's going to warm your sake. But mm. next time I'm going to pre-chill, pre-freeze a glass, pour from the the can into the glass and try that for my next experiment. If we have a few more hot days, I'll have a good excuse to do that. Well, we still have August, so I think we'll have plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, you've never been to Japan in the summer. Is that what I heard before? Right. Uh, yeah. So I've not done the Japan in the summer thing. And, like, honestly, I thought to myself, because, you know, obviously we are fiending to return. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, all right, would you, for me, would I, would I go to Japan for two weeks in like late July, if it meant I can go to Japan, <laughs> hmm. uh, like you know, would it be worth the the intense swampy heat? <laughs> uh, and I don't, I I think I'd probably do it because it's been so long. But 
Uh, but I've never actually experienced it. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe it'd be worth it just for the just for the experience. I imagine I would spend most of my time indoors anyway. Socket bars, all that well, stuff. That's true. But having been to Japan in the summer, it's like it's that experience of stepping outside like into a sweaty oven. And <laughs> it's it's like a wall of wet heat that just oh, lovely. envelops you as you step outside of the hotel and yeah, it's it's really unpleasant. But there is nothing better than going from a really hot, humid outdoors into a nice air-conditioned sake bar and sipping on chilled sake. That is the best, that especially the in best. Japan. <laughs> the best. So maybe you should go in the summer sometime. So out of curiosity, when you, you were obviously there in the summertime when you spent the year in Japan. Yes. Have you also been there in other years for other trips that just happened to be in the summer? Yes. I have gone in the summer for other business trips and things like that. And my favorite memory about the heat in Japan is my first trip to Japan in early September. So I thought, September, I'm from upstate New York. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I brought my corduroy. I brought my sweaters. <laughs> I'm like, sweater weather. And I was thinking like upstate New York temperatures in, in September. And oh, my God. It was so hot even in September. <laughs> oh, no. I brought all the wrong clothes. And uh, yeah, so I, that learned me. Really. I knew some people who had gone to Tokyo in September for, uh, for TGS, the, the Tokyo Game Show which is like a, uh, a video game trade event. And, and they're like, Oh God, it's so hot. And, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, well, really, isn't it like September? And they're like, no, you don't understand. And like in, in Japan, in, in Tokyo, like September is just August junior. Yes. It's it just, is August. <laughs> and it's Absolutely. like, yeah. October is when you get New York. September. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, I can earn that that go in the sun for a couple of minutes before I get into the nice chill sake bar. That'd be nice. That yeah, sounds good. And and people have all kinds of things to beat the heat. Like a lot of people carry these little handheld fans with spritzers on them and <laughs> you see them in New York sometimes, but they're pretty popular in Japan. Yeah. I, I've heard that the sweat towel is like a necessity yes. Yes. in Japan in the summertime. <laughs> yes. It's like you know, it's not a cultural thing. It's a it's, it's it's a bare minimum. You need to have this. <laughs> yes. If you plan to survive. So, what what are your thoughts on this slushy? Does it measure up to what you did in Japan when you did the slushy? It's novel, right? Yeah. I think that that's like the main takeaway from this is the fun thing to do. Uh, you know, if you think about it too much, you'll probably realize that it's not the optimum way to have your sake. <laughs> um, but it's a different way to experience your sake. It's adjacent to, to having a sake bomb. You know, it's right. not, you're not studying it so much. You're just kind of having a good time when it's nice and uh, when it's nice and hot out. Yeah. Well, I will say that when it comes to temperatures, mm -hmm. there is a bottom level that we recommend. So when I teach the sake classes, we talk about sake temperature. Mm -hmm. And the bottom cutoff temperature we usually recommend for serving chilled sake is around 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. So that that's kind of, normally I recommend around 50 for a nice, well-chilled sake, but you don't want to go below 41 because sake can lose its character. It can have a sometimes a little bit of a bitter or unrefined finish to it. And we tasted sake well into that zone, and it really monkeyed with the profile that you normally get, right? Yeah. And these are sakes that we're both really familiar with, that we've right. had dozens of times in the past. Yeah. So, yeah, and it does taste different. Like, it's definitely totally. a, a difference totally. in flavor. Obviously, the texture of the ice crystals contributes to that. Yeah. But, you know, it's also, like you're mentioning, just like when you bring the temperature down so much, you do throw the sake off a little bit. Yeah. So it's really a question of does refreshing outweigh imbalance? Um, you and I talk yeah. about balance all the time, about how you want to have balance in your sake. 
And this definitely takes the balance out. Yes. But it's so refreshing. And it's really fun, too. Yeah. I think it's a fun thing to do every once in a while. But I wouldn't say, like, this is the right way to have your one cup. <laughs> it's definitely not that. But it is a fun distraction and a way to to enjoy sake in a slightly different way than you normally do. Yeah. The one cup bar in Ebisu, Tokyo, that you mentioned, Buri, yeah. I have been there as well. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was delightful. It it's was fun. really fun, wasn't it? Yeah. I really enjoyed it. They had snacks. It was a standing bar. Right. So, right. which is not as common here in the States, but you kind of stand around and sometimes you have these little things you can lean on, but they're mostly just you stand around and you sip your sake. And it was really magical when they brought it out. They tapped it. They give it a little shake. And it just, they, do, do you think they have a freezer there at the perfect temperature? They must, right? So I remember the first time they did it, I remember like looking at the freezer because the freezer is uh, is out on the floor where you can see it. And they do have the, the temperature displayed on the outside. And it was okay. uh, like 24 okay. uh, or something like that Fahrenheit. But yeah, it's, it's a fun experience and a wonderful place. And as a foreigner in Tokyo, your first, you know, first couple of trips when you're trying to get comfortable – a lot of English is spoken there. The menus yeah. are in English and the food is very Western friendly. It's Izakaya okay. food, but it is yeah. very Western friendly. And it's a place I would recommend if you, yeah, you, know, you just want to break <laughs> from a lot of the uncertainty and a lot of the uh, challenge of going to Izakayas mm -hmm. and, and dealing with the language barrier. It's a really nice place to just pop into and be able to just, you know, order uh, some Western friendly stuff in English and have a relaxing time with some interesting sake. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's been years since I've been there, but I remember very well the decoration in inside. They had one cups lining almost every wall inside. Yeah. And to get to the bathroom, you <laughs> yeah, had to pull to one of the walls that. open and the door was covered with one cup. So you pull the door open and uh, it was really a fun place to visit. And I remember the one of the bartenders that waited on me was actually not Japanese. He was Italian. Oh, wow. So they, they are very foreigner friendly there. Yeah. And, and they've got one of the biggest selections of one cups I've ever seen in one place in Japan. Mm hmm. For sure. Since that's, you know, that's their thing, right? So, yeah, they do a great job of it. All right. Yeah. Well, um, I think we have successfully broken our streak of drinking piping hot sake in the <laughs> summer. And I'm glad to see it go. <laughs> We're on the right side of history now, John. Yes. <laughs> well, kind of. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was, it's nice to, to have broken that streak and to have had some cold sake. When it's hot out. Day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we're going to have to hope and pray for another heat wave in August <laughs> so we can have ice sake one more time. <laughs> don't, don't pray for heat oh, waves. No, no, no. <laughs> That was a joke. God of sake, if you're listening, that was a joke. Yeah, so uh, Mizore sake, you can try it at home, one cup or a small bottle, give it a try. Uh, lots and lots of fun. Yeah. Well, John, it was great to taste with you. Uh, I'm so happy to try something fun and different today. I hope you enjoyed your cold sake. I did. All right, excellent. Well, I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us, but especially I want to say hello and thank you to all of our patrons. If you'd like to support us, Patreon is a great way to do that. You can learn more by visiting patreon.com slash sake revolution. And if you'd like to reach out to us directly, we have an email address that we've set up for this very purpose. That email address is feedback at sake revolution dot Com. You can also get at us on social media, Sake Revolution, take a peek, you'll find us on all the major platforms. So until next time, please pick up an ice cold glass. Remember to keep drinking sake and come high.